Good evening. My name is Marina Stilianu, and I am a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dickinson College is on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation. We acknowledge the many indigenous peoples that lived on these lands, as well as the thousands of indigenous children forced into the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879 as part of a federal cultural eradication effort. On behalf of the Clark Forum, the Women's and Gender Resource Center, and the Departments of Psychology and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, the keynote address for Love Your Body Week, Boys, Biceps, and Body Image. As a sociology major here at Dickinson, I study the effects of social norms and perceptions at the individual level. Beauty standards, gender roles, and social pressure all have an effect on our economic consumption, modes of presentation, and most importantly, our mental health. Body image, specifically, is greatly affected by societal standards, and a negative body image can have incredibly insidious effects on mental health and physical well-being. Research suggests that eating disorders often arise from various forms of mental illness and negative body image. However, our perception of what eating disorders look like and who they affect is biased. Often, we believe that these issues only affect women focused on weight loss, when these issues can arise in anyone for various reasons. For many men, eating disorders develop due to the pressures of traditional masculinity. Just as women and girls are overwhelmed by dolls, models, and magazines portraying unhealthy and unrealistic body types, boys and men experience the same pressures. According to statistics from the National Eating Disorders Association, roughly 10 million men in the US will experience disordered eating in their lifetime. With the prevalence of this issue, spreading awareness and support for those affected by eating disorders and body dysmorphia is incredibly important. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Jason Nagata, is an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Adolescent and Young Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and is affiliated faculty with the Institute for Global Health Sciences and the Center for Sexual and Gender Minority Health. Additionally, he is co-founder and co-chair of the International Association for Adolescent, young, Adolescent Health Young Professionals Network. Dr. Nagata specializes in eating disorders, particularly in boys and men, as well as adolescent and young adult physical activity, eating behaviors, food security, nutrition, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and LGBTQ plus health. He led an adolescent health research priorities exercise for the World Health Organization, and his global health work focuses on Kenya and Guatemala. Dr. Nagato was awarded the Young Investigator Award from the Western Society for Pediatric Research in 2022, the Young Professionals Prize from the International Association for Adolescent Health in 2021, and the Emerging Leader in Adolescent Health Award from the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2019. There will be a question and answer session immediately following the program, so please hold all questions until that time. The Clark Forum welcomes differences of opinion expressed politely, thoughtfully, and succinctly. Disruptive behavior or harassment of the speaker, members of the Dickinson community, or audience members will not be tolerated. As a show of respect for our speaker and everyone in attendance, please stay until the end of the program, including the question and answer session. Please join us after the event at the Love Your Body Week Let's Eat reception located in the Hub Social Hall. At this time, I ask you to please silence all cell phones and other electronic devices. In the event of an emergency, please know that handicap accessible exits are located on the west side of the building. And now, please, welcome me in, in, please join me in welcoming our guests, Dr. Jason Nagata. Thank you so much, Marina, for that kind introduction and for the opportunity to talk about gender differences in eating disorders and muscle building behaviors for Love Your Body Week. I thought that I would start today's presentation um, with actually a case of a patient that I saw um, in San Francisco in our eating disorders clinic. So this is a girl, we'll call her Ashley, um, although all the names have been changed for the purposes of confidentiality. Um, and she's a 16-year-old female who felt fat despite weighing less than 100 pounds. Her goal was to lose an additional 30 pounds of weight. 
And in order to achieve this, she would skip breakfast and lunch every day, restricting her food intake to less than 500 calories per day. If she did consume more than 500 calories per day, she would vomit or use laxatives after meals in order to lose weight. Uh, Ashley's story um, illustrates disordered eating behaviors for weight loss, um, including fasting or skipping meals, severe restriction of food intake, vomiting, laxatives, or diuretic use. These are classic weight loss behaviors that we associate with eating disorders. I now want to compare Ashley with another case, this time a boy, who we'll call Johnny, a 16-year-old male wrestler who was referred to our eating disorders clinic as well. However, when we asked him about the typical behaviors for weight loss, such as fasting, restricting, vomiting, or diuretics, he denied all of them. Nonetheless, his parents um, were very concerned um, and say that he has become obsessed with his appearance, but uh, in pursuit of becoming hypermuscular. He attempts to eat at least 300 calories a day of mainly protein, including egg whites, whey protein powder, and protein shakes. He's tried to eliminate fats and carbohydrates from his diet. And in addition to two hours a day of team wrestling practice, he then goes to the gym individually um, to weightlift an additional three hours per day. So what do we call this? Is this anorexia nervosa? Is this an eating disorder? In today's presentation, I wanted to highlight um, special considerations that are often under-recognized related to body image and eating in boys and men. So while Ashley's case shows that the uh, idealized feminine body ideal um, often is um, consistent with weight loss and thinness, often for boys and men, there's a drive for muscularity with leanness rather than thinness. And there may be um, shape concerns, uh, particularly related to muscularity rather than weight concerns. And there may also be different terminology. While um, classically we use the term like binge eating behavior in the eating disorder field, um, some people may have very similar behaviors but call them cheat meals, for instance. Um, and while some people may use compensatory behaviors like vomiting or laxatives um, to compensate for overeating during a meal, um, boys and men may actually use excessive exercise or performance enhancement um, as a compensatory behavior. So to achieve this idealized muscular body type, boys and men may engage in muscle enhancing behaviors that, as Johnny's case um, highlights, could include protein overconsumption, dietary restriction of carbohydrates and fats, uh, appearance and performance enhancing drugs and substances, which can include anabolic steroids, androstenedione, or creatine, as well as compulsive exercise. Now, while engaging in muscle enhancing behaviors alone may not necessarily constitute an eating disorder, they may put young people at risk for one. One recent diagnosis that may capture this phenomenon is muscle dysmorphia also known as vigorexia or reverse anorexia, which is a subtype of body dysmorphic disorder. Muscle dysmorphia is characterized by a preoccupation or obsession with insufficient muscularity, though in most cases an individual's build may objectively be normal or even muscular. It's more common in males and may present with engagement in muscle enhancing behaviors. I performed a literature review on gender differences in eating disorders and found that a vast majority of body image and eating disorder research has focused on thinness and weight loss, particularly in females, and actually less than 1% of body image and eating disorder research has focused specifically in male populations. As we've mentioned, the idealized male body image has become increasingly large and muscular. To illustrate this point, I will cite the work of Harrison Pope at Harvard who examined trends in muscularity of male action figures over time. Here we see Batman and Superman action figures from prior to 2000. Now we see the Batman and Superman figurines that our current children play with. 
Pope found that over a 30-year period, boys' action figures have become increasingly muscular, with larger biceps, shoulders, chests, and more defined abdominal and serratus muscles. Similarly, let's look at earlier Hollywood stars from past decades and the male body image they portray, and contrast that with the current Hollywood stars that also appear to be bigger, bulkier, and have a more defined musculature. Another media-related pressure that has emerged in the last decade is social media. Now, what differentiates social media from more traditional media like television and movies is that for the first time, people can now post content themselves. So people's own bodies are on display now more than ever. Uh, over the past few months, there's been a lot of attention um, from Congress um, on the Facebook files and the impact of social media on girls' body image and eating disorders, as shown by these news headlines from the past few months. I wanted to highlight that an underrecognized story similarly involved body image pressures from social media for boys. Um, and so this was an uh, op-ed that I wrote for the San Francisco Chronicle documenting some of the um, ways in which social media may impact boys' body image as well. And based on the limited research that we do have on social media and boys, um, there actually are unique pressures facing boys on social media. Um, and actually, boys are more likely to allow for public followings than girls on their Instagram accounts. Um, and male selfies are more likely to be full body photos that highlight muscularity um, than just face photos or portraits. Um, one study looked at a thousand um, different body image related Instagram posts um, and found that a majority of male posts depicted muscularity and leanness. Uh, there have also been additional studies that have linked Instagram use in boys and men um, with various disordered eating or muscle building behaviors, including meal skipping, disordered eating, um, muscle dissatisfaction, and use of anabolic steroids. And so while this literature has been um, emerging, uh, I think that it's been really important that, um, you know, along with the original Facebook files that came out in the Wall Street Journal on the mental health impacts of girls, there were subsequent follow-up um, stories and investigative reports looking at links in boys too. Um, and this is an example of uh, one of the, uh, the follow-up uh, articles in the Wall Street Journal um, in which the author, Julie Jargon, interviewed myself and other physicians um, who have taken care of boys who have suffered from eating disorders related to social media. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the research gaps. Um, and there has been such limited research on the weight gain goals or muscle enhancing behaviors um, in population-based studies, so community samples. Um, and the few studies uh, prior to now have been limited to sin single states like Minnesota or Massachusetts. Um, and we don't actually know how prevalent or common this is nationally. Um, and also, the, those studies have focused on teenagers or adolescents, but we also think that this uh, affects people through adulthood. So in the last few years, uh, I've been looking at national data to really understand the epidemiology of muscle-enhancing behaviors in the United States. And so the three uh, studies that I'm going to talk about right now are first looking at the overall prevalence or how common um, weight gain goals and muscle enhancing behaviors are in US adolescents and young adults. Um, secondly, to look at predictors or factors that may be risk factors for um, engagement in muscle enhancing behaviors in young adults. And then finally, to look at long-term health outcomes that could be associated with these behaviors. Um, and for all of these, we look at differences by gender. Um, so for the first study, I used data from the 2015 Youth Risk Behavior Survey. This is a nationally representative um, sample of high school students from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. And so here are some of the results. While only 3% of the male sample um, is 
considered underweight um, objectively by their reported weight and height or body mass index. Um, actually, 19% of boys perceive themselves to be underweight. So therefore, there is a mismatch with what people's actual weight are um, and what their perceived weight is, particularly in boys. One other thing that's important to note is that the survey asks teenagers about what their current weight goals are. And while a lot of research has focused, as I mentioned, on weight loss, I mean, as you can see here, about 61% um, of girls report that they're trying to lose weight. Um, actually, a much, a much greater differences are seen in the weight gain category. So almost 30% of boys uh, across the country say that they're trying to gain weight or build muscle, whereas only 6.5% of girls report that they're trying to gain weight or build muscle. So in the previous slide, I showed that a third of uh, boys are trying to gain weight. Now this slide shows that proportion broken down by um, actual weight status. And so it's not surprising that uh, among people who are objectively considered underweight by their body mass index, so that would be under the fifth percentile, you know, a, a large proportion, over 40%, um, report that they're trying to gain weight for both girls in the um, pink and boys in the blue. Uh, but where we start to see gender differences is in those who are ob objectively considered to be normal weight, 40% of boys still report that they're trying to gain weight, whereas it's much lower in girls. Um, and actually, if we look um, based on BMI, even boys who would be objectively considered to be overweight or obese, um, over 10% of those are still reporting that they're trying to gain weight, um, particularly to build muscle. So in order to look into young adulthood, as I mentioned, uh, I had to look at the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health, called Ad Health. Um, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey only looked at high school students, whereas this study started in high school, but it followed people through college and later in adulthood. So here you can see that in the first wave, um, the participants were 11 to 18 years old, um, and then it followed them a year later, and then seven years later, and so on and so forth. So in the next series of slides, I'm going to show prevalence estimates of muscle enhancing behaviors um, on the y-axis by um, age on the x-axis. So you can see rates by, um, by age. So here, this is engagement in any muscle enhancing behavior. And you can see that it's higher overall in boys than girls, and it peaks around age 20 to 22, where almost 30% of boys report um, engaging in some muscle enhancing behavior. Some of those common muscle enhancing behaviors include weightlifting, which is the solid line, um, and otherwise just general exercise for muscle enhancement. And again, you can see that it's more common in boys than in girls. Now, this question looked at supplements um, uh, and specifically uh, supplements for muscle enhancement and dieting for muscle enhancement. Um, and again, you can see higher in males than females, um, but about 6% of males by age 20 or 22 report that they're using that. Um, and there were a number of supplement questions. So this one looks specifically at legal versus illegal supplements, so steroids um, currently are illegal to use in the United States. Um, and you can see that in boys, about 2.8% um, of young adults report using steroids, um, whereas it's much more common to use the legal performance enhancing substance, which could include creatine, um, where anywhere from 15 to 17% um, of boys report using legal supplements. So moving on to our next question, which is what are predictors of muscle enhancing um, substance use uh, in males? We did find that there were um, differences by race. So actually um, black or African-American uh, males were more likely to engage in muscle building behaviors. Um, also, we found that unsurprisingly, those with a lower body mass index, so those who were more likely to be underweight reported that they wanted to uh, 
gain weight or muscle, um, and then also participation in team sports. Uh, we also found that um, experiencing adverse childhood experiences, um, such as sexual abuse, physical abuse, or neglect in childhood, um, was specifically related to use of anabolic steroid um, later in young adulthood. One of the interesting things about the uh, longitudinal sample, so following these same participants all the way from adolescence into their adulthood, is that we can see patterns of use. Um, and so um, one question that we had was, while there are some of these substances that are legal, like as I mentioned, creatine, um, to what extent do those legal substances then serve as a gateway to potentially more harmful and dangerous substances like steroids? So here we looked at um, people who were using legal substances like creatine, um, and this was at ages 18 to 26, so around you know, the college years. And then uh, we looked at their use seven years later. And interestingly, we found that uh, those who used creatine or these legal substances at ages 18 to 26 were much more likely to subsequently use steroids seven years later than those um, who didn't use the legal substances. Um, and the next slide just shows the same statistic, but adjusting for, um, but adjusting for potential um, confounders. And so similarly, we found that use of these legal substances um, was people who use legal performance enhancing substances were three, more, more than three times more likely to um, engage in steroid use seven years later. Um, and we also found that they were more likely to have alcohol related problems like binge drinking or engaging in risky behaviors while under the influence of alcohol or legal problems while under the influence of alcohol or use of alcohol despite emotional or physical health problems. So this body of work has several clinical um, and public health implications. First, I think it's important to note that males and females may have differing body image goals, which can lead to different behaviors in pursuit of muscularity and thinness. Now, of course, these are generalizations um, across the population. Um, and there are certainly, as we have seen, there are some girls who are trying to build muscle, and there may be some boys who are trying to lose weight and become thin. Um, but these sort of reflect some of the general trends and gender norms and pressures that um, young people face today. Um, second, given that a third of teenage boys report that they're trying to gain weight or bulk up, I think it's important to just not assume that everyone's trying to lose weight and that that's the, the ideal. Um, and for you know, physicians like myself and um, other clinicians or public health professionals, I think we're really trained to screen for weight loss behaviors and counsel about that. Um, but I think there's very little discussion about muscle building or weight gain goals and muscle enhancing behaviors that um, you know, could be uh, relevant and, and also affect, affect people's health. And in terms of policy implications, um, I just wanted to highlight uh, a few kind of interesting current events and public policy uh, things that are being debated actually today. Uh, so back in 1994, um, Congress passed uh, an act that actually at the federal level that um, prohibits the Food and Drug Administration from um, really regulating or monitoring um, supplements and diet pills um, at, a, at a national level. And so any regulation um, because of that act has to be done at the state level. Um, and there are actually a number of states now that are pushing um, for more oversight and regulation um, for some of these supplements uh, at the state level. And so Massachusetts, New York, and my home state of California are all, all have bills um, in state legislatures, um, specifically looking at uh, restriction of, of either diet pills or muscle building substances um, for minors. So again, it wouldn't apply to adults, but for, for children. Um, and it would 
kind of similar to the rules that are in place for tobacco, um, it kind of restricts the sales of minor to minors because right now anyone can go to a supermarket or like a GNC or, um, or buy these products online, including children. It would uh, require some uh, storage behind like locked displays um, and then also some signage highlighting some known risks. Um, and so it's just to say that these are actually issues that are being debated right now um, at the state level. And so, as I mentioned, um, California is one of the states in which this is being debated. Um, and the bill in California actually just recently passed through the state assembly and is um, being um, debated next at the state Senate level. Uh, so while not everyone, as I mentioned, who are using these muscle building substances, um, you know, will have eating disorders, uh, there are are evidence, and particularly actually from college-based um, studies, that indicates that people who use these performance-enhancing uh, substances are at greater risk for eating disorders. So I'm just going to highlight two studies um, from college samples. This one was actually looking at the top 10 um, NCAA um, swimming programs um, and looked at 16, uh, 33 students from those colleges um, and found that athletes um, who use sports supplements um, were more likely to have higher eating disorder symptoms um, and specifically more concerns about their shape and then also more dietary restraints. Um, I also wanted to highlight a more general college study that actually was just published in the last month. Um, and this was using the Healthy Minds study. Um, so this uh, study sampled 18 colleges or in universities across the U.S. Um, and found similar to what we found at that national level in ad health that about a third of males reported protein supplement use um, and 16% of females. This was uh, and then lower rates uh, of creatine, so about 15% in males and 2% in females. So again, quite common. Um, and then also in this general college sample, um, use of these supplements was associated with um, a positive eating disorder screen. So again, it doesn't mean that people have eating disorders, but it does, uh, people who do use these supplements are at greater risk of developing one in the, in the future. Um, so, up until now, we've focused on some of the weight gain attempts and muscle enhancing behaviors um, that I think are kind of under-recognized and, and novel, but I also wanted to examine gender differences in some of those more classic disordered eating behaviors that traditionally are for weight loss. Um, and so we will use actually those same samples to look at gender differences in, um, in the weight loss behaviors. So, um, I actually want to introduce one other case. Um, so this is Robert, a 15-year-old boy who was previously considered obese um, when he was in high school. And because of this, he was teased and he was bullied. Um, and he was actually encouraged by his parents and his pediatrician and teachers to lose weight. Um, so in a period of six months, he lost over 50 pounds. Um, and went from sort of the quote unquote obese to a normal weight range. Um, but in order to achieve this, he began fasting and skipping meals um, and would exercise for four hours a day. Uh, so he actually eventually was diagnosed with um, atypical anorexia nervosa, which is another new diagnosis that was created in the most recent um, diagnostic and statistical manual. Um, and so according to the, the DSM, which is sort of the Bible for mental health disorders, um, atypical anorexia nervosa is when all the criteria for anorexia nervosa are met. So, um, you know, fear of weight gain um, and some of those uh, weight loss behaviors. But it, despite um, the weight loss, the individual's weight is either within or above the normal range. Um, and actually, new research has demonstrated that 70% of people with anorexia or atypical anorexia nervosa um, have had a prior history of overweight or obesity. Um, and recent studies have actually shown that um, half of the 
people now who are uh, either admitted to the hospitals for eating disorders or referred for eating disorder care actually have this diagnosis of atypical anorexia nervosa, um, which is just to say that you really can't tell if somebody has an eating disorder or body image issues just by their appearance. Um, you know, half of the people who we care for with eating disorders actually would objectively have a quote unquote normal or above normal weight range. Um, but of note, the studies that have looked at atypical anorexia nervosa have found um, equally severe um, eating disorder symptoms and medical complications um, in this atypical versus typical um, anorexia nervosa. So it is still a very serious um, illness that has important mental health and physical health consequences. So um, given the rise in presentations of atypical anorexia nervosa, um, and then the understudied intersection of eating disorders and, and obesity and gender, um, I wanted to examine uh, the epidemiology of uh, disordered eating behaviors, both by gender and by weight status. Um, and so I had a similar uh, set of aims, first to look at the prevalence of disordered eating behaviors, um, and then look at predictors, and similar looking at outcomes, um, and for each of these to look at differences by, by gender and by weight status. So I wanted to provide some definitions, the terms that I will be using for uh, these set of analyses and slides. Um, so the survey asks about unhealthy weight control behaviors, which refers to vomiting, fasting, skipping meals, or laxative or diuretic use to lose weight. Um, binge eating behaviors are defined as eating so much in a short period that they would be embarrassed if others had seen it. Um, and then disordered eating behaviors uh, include all of the above. So either uh, engaging in an unhealthy weight control behavior or, or binge eating. So this is just a graphical representation of the three questions that we will go through. Um, again, using that uh, longitudinal cohort study that follows people, uh, the same set of people from their teenage years through later adulthood. And so the, the first aim is looking at the prevalence in young adulthood. So again, sort of college age, 18 to 26. Uh, the second aim is looking at um, adolescent predictors of these disordered eating behaviors. Um, and then the last aim is to look at potential health outcomes and particularly uh, cardiovascular um, and metabolic outcomes at seven year follow up. So we use the same uh, cohort study, the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent um, to Adult Health, which follows these same people over uh, several years from their teenage years to young adulthood. Um, and so let's look at the prevalence data from our first aim, um, looking at how common this is in young adults. So this is a bar graph of the prevalence of disordered eating behaviors by gender and by weight status. Um, females are in red and males are in blue. Um, and young adults who are considered underweight or normal weight um, have a BMI less than or equal to 25 kilograms per meter squared um, on the left. And then those considered overweight or obese have a BMI greater than 25 on the right. Um, so as you can see, the prevalence of disordered eating behaviors is actually is more common um, overall in females than males. Um, and it's also more common in young adults who would be considered overweight or obese versus underweight or normal weight. Um, so here we can see that almost 30% of young women considered overweight or obese engage in at least one type of these disordered eating behaviors. Um, and this is a graphical representation um, of the prevalence of disordered eating behaviors um, just by the four BMI categories. Um, and as you can see, um, actually adults with obesity or with the highest BMI categories actually have the highest rates of disordered eating behaviors. And so I think this is also a very um, important um, lesson that I think most people assume that eating disorders mostly affect people who are very thin and underweight, but actually that at a sort of a population level, um, 
people who are engaging in sort of disordered eating behaviors are actually much more likely to be on the overweight and obese um, spectrum. Now, um, having determined that the prevalence of eating of disordered eating behaviors does differ by gender and by weight status, uh, we wanted to look at predictors of disordered eating behaviors um, similarly by, by gender and weight status. Now, there have been prior literature um, looking at predictors of unhealthy weight controlled behaviors um, that have found that family dysfunction or disconnectedness or school disconnectedness um, could be associated with the development of unhealthy weight controlled behaviors. Um, but those prior studies haven't looked at differences by gender or weight status. And so we really wanted to see if there were differences in these um, categories. So this figure shows results from a regression analysis that adjusts for um, age and race and income. Um, and here the top set of predictors are um, family factors. Um, and then there are also school and community factors that you can see. Um, and we looked at it separately um, by female versus male, and then also by weight status, so underweight or overweight obese. Um, and so one thing that I think is really striking is that all those traditional risk factors that have been identified previously really only applied to the um, female sample who were underweight or normal weight. Um, and actually, those, and those are here in the red. Um, but actually, those same um, risk factors did not apply to males for the most part, and they also didn't apply to females who were um, considered overweight or obese. So I think that um, that was one surprise for us because um, you know previous studies that have not looked at these differences just <coughs> um, assume that you know these are the factors that affect everyone. But it seems like that actually mostly affects um, females who are underweight or normal weight. So that, yeah, there you can see those. Um, and so, yeah, these traditional risk factors that have been published in the literature on family disconnectedness or school disconnectedness don't seem to really be applicable in males or in those who are of higher weight. Um, now, for the last aim, we wanted to determine potential health consequences of these disordered eating behaviors in later adulthood. So again, following these young adults seven years later. So this figure looks at um, body mass index um, change um, seven years later. Um, and I think that one of the important take homes here is that um, those with um, DEB is disordered eating behavior. Um, so for both males and females, those who engaged in disordered eating behaviors um, and presumably with the goal of losing weight, um, very um, sadly, actually, in the end, in the long run, seven years later, they've actually gained more weight or more BMI than those who were not doing anything to control their weight. So I think that this could be a lesson um, that, you know, some of these uh, crash diets or um, behaviors really meant to control weight actually are not, an effect, not effective in the long run. Um, we also um, had access to laboratory values. And so we looked at um, cardiometabolic outcomes at seven year follow-up. Uh, and we looked at the relationship between engaging in disordered eating um, and then cholesterol, diabetes, and hypertension seven years later. Um, and this figure shows one um, significant association that we found, which was that men who reported binge eating um, actually had higher um, cholesterol during the follow-up period um, than those who didn't. Um, but that same association was not seen for, um, for women. Now, we don't know exactly why that is, but some possibilities um, could be that, um, we, that men may binge eat on certain types of foods um, that are different than females. So as we mentioned, um, like the cheat meal or binge eating, um, you know, men may be more likely to eat fatty foods or, or like meat products, whereas some studies have shown that women are more likely to binge on sweets. Um, and so that 
maybe one of the differences related to the, the cholesterol differences, um, but we're really not sure why. Um, and so this is just showing that same uh, thing, that's the graph, but this is also adjusting for um, potential other factors that could influence that, but that finding still held true in the, in the men. Uh, we also looked at diabetes risk. Um, and so in just sort of unadjusted comparisons, we similarly find that men and women who um, engage in disordered eating behaviors actually have higher risk of diabetes seven years later. Um, but after adjusting for some factors that could influence that outcome like race, age, uh, and baseline BMI or education, um, those uh, associations were, uh, were less significant, were no longer significant. And we didn't find associations with hypertension. So uh, just in summary, uh, we found that disordered eating behaviors were more common in females and also young adults um, who would be considered overweight or obese. Um, and young adults who engage in disordered eating behaviors are actually more likely to gain more weight and BMI in the long run than those who don't. Um, and uh, binge eating behaviors are associated with um, higher cholesterol in males, and then possibly because of the different types of foods that they may binge on. Uh, so thus far, we've looked at research looking at population-based um, studies across the US um, that have really looked at the epidemiology of muscle building behaviors and eating disorders. Um, and I wanted to uh, talk briefly about um, actually some medical or clinical research um, looking at um, some of the medical complications of eating disorders in adolescent boys and young men. And so as a physician um, researcher, while I do do population-based research, um, as I mentioned, I also take care of um, teenagers and young adults who are um, medically compromised with eating disorders and need to be hospitalized. And so um, another area of research that I have is looking at um, medical complications of eating disorders for among people who actually have a diagnosis and, um, and are suffering. And so um, I want, I've also been looking at gender differences in medical complications of eating disorders. Um, and I think it's just important to note that you know, eating disorders are very complex because there's obviously a very strong mental health component, but because of the energy imbalances and starvation states, um, you know, there are also very serious physical health consequences and actually eating disorders can cause um, consequences uh, and medical complications in every organ system of your body, from your heart to your brain to your lungs um, to your um, blood system. And again, similar to previous trends, you know, most research has focused on female samples but there is a limited and growing um, body of research looking at medical complications of, of eating disorders in males. And so this is just an example of one review article that we looked at. Um, and I do think that one, um, from the medical standpoint, one reason why eating disorders may be underdiagnosed and underrecognized in boys and men is actually because um, there is so limited research on the topic our current guidelines for providers, um, and even that um, diagnostic and statistical manual, the DSM um, handbook for diagnosis, I think is very skewed towards female samples. And so up until very recently, actually, the di that DSM um, required that in order to have a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa, um, you had to have skipped periods. And obviously, boys don't have periods, so that um, doesn't really apply to them. And uh, the medical term for a missed period is amenorrhea. Um, and still throughout our medical guidelines, there are um, places that say that, um, you know, using periods as a marker of medical instability for further workup. And so this is just an example of one of our current guidelines that says that if you've missed your period for six months or more, um, that puts you actually at increased fracture risk um, and and lower bone density, and so you should ob obtain an x-ray to assess for bone density. Um, but uh, boys don't have that amenorrhea marker, so there's no guidance as to when to you know, assess bone health in, in boys with eating disorders. 
Um, and so one specific question that I wanted to look into is actually what is what are bone impacts in boys with eating disorders? And I think one thing that is um, you know, interesting about eating disorders is that because they often onset during the adolescent and young adult period, um, you know, if, if a young person is affected by an eating disorder while they're in puberty, there can be some of the sort of irreversible effects can be if you, you know, sort of miss your growth spurt or your window for growth. Um, you know, you may not be able to grow it back later in life because you sort of have that critical puberty window to, to gain your height. Um, and actually bone health is very similar to, to your growth spurt in that you have a certain period in which you can accrue bone density and that also mirrors your, your puberty. And so when people um, are affected by eating disorders during that critical time period in puberty, um, they, you know, maybe basically they may stop growing and so they may be shorter than they normally would have been otherwise and they also um, may have weaker bones because it happens during that important developmental window. So we wanted to look at uh, bone effects in, of eating disorders in boys versus girls. Um, and because of this, um, uh, this guideline that only talks about amenorrhea, we also actually surveyed doctors who are um, adolescent health specialists um, from the professional society called the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. And uh, you know, over half of them reported that they felt more confident assessing bone density in females, whereas none were confident assessing bone density in males, um, likely due to this big research gap. Um, and so we did compare bone density in males versus females with anorexia nervosa um, using these x-rays on or DEXA scans um, and basically found that um, males with anorexia nervosa have just as severe bone deficits um, across all bone sites of the entire whole body, the spine, um, your femoral neck and your hip. Um, compared to females, despite the fact that there's no guidance as to when to assess for bone density in, in males. Um, one other area that uh, I recently um, looked at, actually just this article was just published within the last month, was also looking at nutrition um, protocols for uh, people who are hospitalized with eating disorders. So um, this was actually looking at all of the teenagers and young adults who we who have been hospitalized at UCSF in our hospital um, over the last eight years. Um, and right now, our um, nutrition protocols are not gender specific. So for the most part, everyone who is admitted um, at our hospital, and this is a very similar protocol uh, across the country, most people with eating disorders, um, as part of their nutritional plan, start off with um, getting a 2,000-calorie 2000, 2000 diet, um, and then it increases um, day by day, slowly, as needed. Um, and on average, um, you can see here the boys or young men end up being discharged at around 3,700 calories per day versus 2,900 um, for girls. And, you know, that may seem high, but again, these are people who have, you know, who are hospitalized, who have, who are growing teenagers for the most part, who are undergoing puberty, uh, and then who also have deficits to make up. Um, so on average, there are, you can see that um, boys actually require more nutrition than girls, um, but because we don't have a differentiation, um, they end up being hospitalized for longer because they, it takes longer to get to that goal. Um, so that is just another way that I feel like <clears throat> um, care for boys with eating disorders is, um, is lacking. So um, just to sort of wrap up that, um, I'm actually very excited that um, all of this work that we've been working on um, has culminated in a book that was actually just published in 2021, so just in the last year, um, providing clinical guidance for eating disorders in, in boys and men. Um, and actually right now, um, actually this week, in fact, we are updating that um, guideline from the Society for Adults and Health and Medicine to include more, to be more gender inclusive and include some of the, um, the points about how to help guidance for, for boys and men. Um, and 
I'm also very excited to be working on um, future research looking at eating disorders and muscle dysmorphia in uh, diverse populations, not just by gender, but also by sexual orientation. So um, we have uh, access to data from the PRIDE study, which has 20,000 LGBTQ people across the US, um, and then also looking at eating disorders um, cross-culturally um, in international settings. Um, and so, yeah, just as an example, we, are, uh, we have a, done this eating disorder and muscle dysmorphia assessment among all the participants in the PRIDE study. So um, we're sort of publishing now for the first time some of the eating disorder symptoms and muscle dysmorphia and, um, and muscle building supplement use um, in LGBTQ populations. Um, and actually, uh, two years ago, we developed a validation tool um, or sort of a questionnaire that assesses for muscularity-oriented eating. Um, so again, um, allowing providers to not just ask about the traditional weight loss behaviors, but some of these muscularity-oriented behaviors. Um, and those are, the initial paper was published in English, um, but it, it's really been exciting to work with collaborators from all around the, the world um, who've been translating it and studying this phenomenon in um, Spanish, Chinese, Turkish, Persian, Farsi, and Brazilian Portuguese, um, which has been really rewarding. Um, and just to close, um, since we, you know, unfortunately are still dealing with the pandemic um, and various resurgences, um, you know, the pandemic, I think, has had a really especially hard toll on people with eating disorders. Um, you know, the social isolation, disruption in daily routines, and just generalized anxiety has really made it worse. Um, and also just has had, um, I think we've had a lot more new cases and those who have, were already affected have just, uh, I think, really been suffering more and more. Um, and I do think that potentially the rise in social media use during the pandemic as people like weren't able to you know meet in person um, and then just being locked into these sort of vicious cycles of being on your phone and doom scrolling all the time has had an effect so like nationally the national eating disorders association which does have a helpline um, so if anybody knows of anyone who needs help you can always call that helpline they've reported almost a doubling um, in uh, calls to their helpline and we've similarly seen about a doubling in um, young people who need to be hospitalized for eating disorders during the pandemic. And um, those numbers are pretty consistent across the US. Um, so uh, I do hope that um, if you know of anyone who has any of these issues or, um, or do feel like you uh, may be affected by some of these issues, um, you know, it's, I think it's important to talk to your primary care provider or a trusted friend or adults. And as I mentioned, there's a helpline. Uh, I think going to your primary care doctor is all, always a good step um, to get into uh, additional uh, mental health and, and medical services. Um, so with that, I just wanted to thank um, all of the students and trainees that I um, am very fortunate to work with. Um, and then also a number of mentors um, and collaborators from, as I mentioned, around the US and around the world, um, and also a number of funding agencies. So um, with that, I think I will end the formal presentation. Happy to take questions. It is now time for the question and answer session. Because this event is being recorded, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to reach you before asking your question. We reserve the first questions for students and then we will open it up to the rest of the audience. We will now take the first question. Thank you. Um, so you discussed how you're uh, seeking to expand into research in LGBTQ populations. Um, I was curious if uh, just like preliminary or, um, 
you're you're looking at all into um, specifically like trans men who take steroids as a part of therapy and how that might impact some of the other factors where you're looking at men and their steroid use as an actual symptom or, or signal of eating disorders? Yeah, that's a really important question. Thanks so much um, for raising that. And I, I do think that, um, you know, it, with it, all these diverse populations, like any individual, um, you know, the sort of mechanism or reasons for body dissatisfaction can be very personal and they can be different for different people. Um, and I will just say that um, in our trans community, um, it's very complex because I think there is some amount of, especially like before people are able to get, as you mentioned, hormone therapy or surgical therapy to sort of, um, uh, to match their gender identity and like their outward appearance um, with their gender identity. Um, there is just a lot of dissatisfaction, I think, with, with one's body. I think that just gender identity, they're, it's so entwined with gender norms and these appearance norms. So I do think that like our, I, I have to say that um, perhaps the highest rates that we've seen of, of eating disorder or body dissatisfaction, at least in our clinic population, um, has been in uh, gender minority populations. Um, I do think that the good news um, is that some preliminary studies have found that actually once people are able to get gender affirming therapy um, or uh, you know, the, whether hormones or surgical, actually the, that body dissatisfaction um, goes down or their, their overall satisfaction with their appearance does get better. Um, so that I think is good. And in some ways um, it's, yeah, I mean, that is actually part of the therapy for, for dealing with, with body dissatisfaction. But to your point, I think uh, my main concern is actually just the use of anabolic steroids like without the supervision of a medical professional because if people are using these illicit substances on their own without any monitoring you know there are um you know, like very significant consequences to all your organ systems like your heart your kidney your um, liver and so um you know if people are i mean I, I certainly do think that hormone therapy in transgender populations can be warranted but i would not advise people to do it on their own. I think they need to have support and sort of monitoring for that. Thank you so much for this really thought-provoking presentation. I noticed that several of the studies that you shared with us relied on the BMI to categorize normal or obesity or overweight or underweight. And I think that there have been a lot of public criticisms of the BMI and that usage. And so I'm wondering um, how problematizing the BMI might impact the, the conclusions of your research on eating disorders in young men and boys. Yes, thank you so much for that question as well. Um, yeah, there are many limitations to body mass index. Um, I think one of the prime ones in terms of what we're talking about in muscularity is that, you know, BMI is just a very uh, simple calculation based on weight and height, and it doesn't capture body composition. And so um, the classic example is that when Arnold Schwarzenegger was Mr. Universe, you know, and he had like 2% body fat, uh, he was actually considered obese because he had so much muscle mass, um, his just by weight alone and his height, he would have been considered obese, but obviously he had like no body fat with that. And so that's like an extreme example, but just to say that, especially with some of these muscularity concerns, BMI is a very poor measure um, uh, to capture that. And I think that, as you mentioned, there are uh, you know lots of limitations to that. Um, I just have been using BMI at sort of the population level because, um, you know, height and weight is something that is pretty much routinely assessed um, at most primary care visits. So it's data that's available while it is flawed. Um, and I think from the medical community, um, everything is also kind of a, a cost benefit ratio because as we know, healthcare is so expensive. And so while it would be more accurate to, for, for instance, like get like those DEXA scans, which can really 
differentiate body composition, um, it, for the most part, it doesn't really change management for most people, and it would really skyrocket even more our healthcare costs to sort of do that. So I think it's a little bit of a balance between you know what data we have and like what is kind of easily collected, um, but I versus you know sort of that that cost benefit ratio. Um, but I think you're absolutely right in, in that these categories um, can be stigmatizing, um, especially, um, you know, like referring to people as like overweight or obese. And, and I think part of what I was trying to capture is that um, as a medical community, we need to be very careful with our language too, because I, I do think that um, the obesity epidemic has been sort of in the common narrative and popular media. Um, and is very much, um, you know, on the minds of even medical professionals, like assessing for obesity is recommended, you know, by national organizations. Um, and, you know, there are potentially health risks associated with that, but I, I think that what's missing right now from sort of medical training is a little bit more of a thoughtful approach to, um, as, you, as you mentioned, like not body shaming, but then also, you know, if you're going to, tell someone to lose weight, really highlighting way, different ways of achieving that and really discouraging some of these more unhealthy weight controlled behaviors and particularly ones that as we've seen like in the long run actually lead to more weight gain. Um, so, but I do think that it's a very important discussion to be having um, about just the language that we use and the terminology. Um, but I think that yeah, it's actually very interesting for me because as a physician, um, but also as sort of like an eating disorder research, I, I have to sort of tiptoe this fine balance between, you know, using data that is available and also that, you know, government agencies, um, you, you know, traditionally use um, for the general public versus also, you know, being very thoughtful about the language and making sure it's not stigmatizing. Hi, uh, thanks again for coming to speak with us. It's been a great presentation. Um, so in your presentation, you talk a lot about like the social factors surrounding eating disorders, which I think is very important, but it kind of got me thinking about biological factors too between um, males and females. And I was kind of wondering about the different metabolic processes. Um, this might be a complete overgeneralization on my part, but I know that um, a lot of times it's said that males have faster metabolisms than females, and I'm, not, I'm curious if that has any um, relation to the prevalence of eating disorders in males and females, if that's a factor that you guys look at, or um, anything like that, or other biological factors. Yeah, that's a really great question, and I'd love to do more research in that realm. Um, I will say that some of the preliminary research that's been done on biological factors has shown that um, eating disorders um, can have like a genetic component. So um, like the most commonly researched genetic factor uh, or diagnosis is anorexia nervosa. And it does seem like there are particular genes that could be associated with that. Um, but I, I do think that, yeah, the, there is so much data that needs to be um, more research in males because I, I do think that the current diagnostic um, categories that we have like anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa are very female centric in themselves. And I guess part of what I, I, I guess I haven't said overtly yet, but what I, I eventually am trying to say in moving forward these guidelines is that our current eating disorder diagnoses don't really capture this muscularity oriented um, phenomenon. And so I think we need to have better characterization of that. For the most part, these boys and men who are coming to our clinic um, don't get, they don't meet these criteria, so they just get an unspecified eating disorder diagnosis. Um, and I think that does have um, implications for like getting into treatment and therapy, because if they don't you know, meet certain criteria, then their insurance won't cover certain things. Um, so I, I do think that more research needs to be done in that, um, and specifically in those biological mechanisms. Um, but yeah, we, we just, we haven't gotten there yet, but I, it's a great, I think, direction for future research.
Hi, um, thank you again for presenting tonight. My question is how much uh, research on this topic has been conducted like across cultures? Is this primarily um, a problem we're seeing in the US specifically or is this more globally? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think that um, it has, you know, there's already been such limited research in the US, but we are showing that, you know, it is quite, uh, at least some of these general sort of muscularity concerns, performance enhancing subs, you know, supplement use are quite common in the US. Um, but um, there are, I feel like one of the, yeah, the future research directions that I've been mentioning is that we, I think we recently did a five country collaboration um, looking at this in Mexico, the US, Canada, Australia, and UK. Um, and, you know, I think there were somewhat similar trends, but I think what I'm actually most excited about is, um, as I mentioned, we have um, collaborators in Argentina and Brazil, in which we were seeing similar trends with, with muscularity. Um, interestingly enough, there was actually a international body image conference in Mexico right before the pandemic. Um, and I was, I, even though I sort of thought that steroid use was, you know, more would be more common in the U.S. Um, actually, in Mexico, you can just buy steroids at, at like over the counter at pharmacies there, and they like advertise them quite heavily. So I, I was a little bit shocked actually that, um, that you know that it's just that easily accessible there. Um, and, um, and and as I mentioned, we have also been collaborating with people in China. And so I, I so I do think that you know there's more certainly to come, but it does seem like these muscularity pressures um, have have permeated cross culturally. Hi. Also, this has been really interesting. Um, I was wondering, I actually, to give you some context, I was coming here and I told my friend that he should come with me because he's also pre-med. Um, and he like even like made it into like a joke because like it's so naturalized, like assume that like all men want to get like muscular and bulky and like eating disorders for like males like doesn't exist. Um, like what do you think Because like for girls and like you see a lot of like body positivity and body neutrality for like girls especially on like media and stuff and they don't see as much like for men like what do you think would be like the first steps to kind of like I guess like argue or try to like get rid of this idea that like men have to be like most like muscular yeah I think that that's a really great um, point um, and I think that <laughs> there has been a lot of I mean, I, th I think across mental health in general, there has been, I think, a little bit more of a movement, um, you know, kind of against this like toxic masculinity for uh, like, you know, allowing boys and men to just open up more about, you know, just mental health and about struggles and, um, and not having to feel like you have to internalize all of that. So I, I do think that, um, you know, there are um, more and more like, I guess somewhat high profile people who've opened up about body image, um, you know, like rugby players, athletes um, across the, and, and I, I think that one other lesson from this is that there are just so many different body pressures that for different reasons. So, I mean, just as an example for like the Olympics right now, like last, at, during the last Olympics, like Adam Rippon, who was like a figure skater, opened up about how he had an eating disorder. But I think that the pressures that are, um, on body image for like figure skaters and gymnasts, like could be different than the pressures, you know, for rugby players and football players. Um, but I do think that having more um, high profile people kind of open up about some of those concerns and struggles can help to like normalize it for, for people. Um, and I think more and more while social media um, can have this overall, you know, impact of potentially making people feel worse about their bodies. I also think that there has been a trend, like it's not quite common, as common as, as muscularity trends, but, you know, people also opening up on social media about the pressures that they've been facing. And I think particularly um, people when they, uh, oftentimes like influencers will have very highly curated, um, you know, post very high, high post very highly curated posts like, of, you know, them, you know, maybe they'll have a photo shoot and they'll take like a hundred photos and they'll take the what they'll post the one photo that 
is the most flattering, um, you know, in the right light and has all these filters. But I also think that, you know, more and more there are these trends of people just showing unfiltered, like unflattering posts to show like, actually, this is the reality that we live in. Um, and I think that there is some reinforcement for that. But I, I do think that I'm trying to uh, encourage that discussion. And I, I also think that at the school level, um, I mean, even forums like like this and having open discussions um, about some of these um, issues, like I think is a really important step. Um, thanks for your presentation today. Um, I think at, towards the end, you talk about effects of eating disorder, and you talk a lot about like physical effects, like bond density and all of that, but I, like maybe I haven't heard it right, but there's not a lot of uh, mentioning about psychological effects of eating disorder, and then I don't know exactly if you're, you know, kind of moving forward that way or if there's any existing literature on that, um, and whether you think kind of, you know, thinking about um, exploring mental disorders and how that could kind of exacerbate um, symptoms of eating disorder as well. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, I think a little bit of that is just a little bit, bit of my bias because as a, um, as a physician, like I think one of the lucky things that I, the things that I love about my job is that I get to work with an interdisciplinary team. So I got to work with like psychiatrists and therapists and nutritionists. Um, and we all kind of work as a team to help support our patients. Um, but because of that, I think my clinical focus is a little bit more on the physical health side. So that's why some of my research has reflected that a little bit more, but there certainly is a lot of really important mental health work um, and research to be done. And I've like dabbled in that a little bit, but I'm, you know, I'm not a licensed psychologist or a psychiatrist. So I think a little bit of that is just my own limitations and um, training. Um, but I do think that some, from what I know offhand, I actually do think that there have been some preliminary studies on like mental health comorbidity and eating disorders, because there are you know, many patients who in addition to having an eating disorder could have depression or anxiety. Um, or a substance use disorder. Um, I think some of the early studies actually showed that men with eating disorders were more likely to have um, comorbidity with other mental health diagnoses. And so I do think that um, trying to understand like exactly what that overlap is and, and why, um, particularly with substance use, I think it would be an important area for future work. We have time for one more question. Hi, um, I have another question. Um, one of the symptoms of, I guess, like eating disorders was specifically um, anorexia nervosa, or, like one of the more like severe symptoms is infertility. And I was wondering amongst like males, if it's been researched, if there's also infertility in males or boys. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, I don't know if there, I don't know of direct studies that have looked at infertility, but um, as I mentioned, you know, when you're in a starvation state or malnutrition, um, you can have, you're basically, your body basically shuts down. And so it kind of preserves the limited energy that you have um, to your vital organs. So, you know, it, it prioritizes your heart and your brain and everything else kind of shuts down. And so that includes your, um, what we call our hypo, like our HPG axis or hypothalamic um, pituitary goat. It would just to say that the, our hormones shut down, including in men, that would be like sort of your testosterone levels. So, so boys with eating disorders, depending on how severe it is, have much lower testosterone levels. Um, and so I imagine that that can influence your, I guess, fertility and as well as libido. Um, so um, 
again, there hasn't been like a lot of studies in, in that, but um, but certainly it's been documented that like sex drive and testosterone levels in, in boys goes down. And then that also uh, affects growth, as I mentioned. This concludes tonight's presentation. Please remember to join us at the Hub Social Hall for the Love Your Body Week Let's Eat reception. And please join me in thanking Dr. Nagata.